ideas, innovations and action. Join us for an appointment with the continent on the move. This is Initiative Africa, coming up today. We will be talking to Professor Emmanuel Nandosi, Executive Secretary of the ACBF, about the new challenges facing capacity building in Africa. We met him in Harare, Zimbabwe, at the African Capacity Building Foundation's 25th anniversary in May. With millions of young Africans affected by chronic unemployment, businesses are struggling to find qualified workers. In Ethiopia, the Salam College shows how education can be tailored to prepare students to join the workplace. Where once they were overlooked, they are now an integral part of any development forum in Africa. Activists from civil society are now key players. We take a look at the NGOs and associations giving a voice to local inhabitants. Representatives from civil society now have their rightful place alongside government officials and financial backers in discussions on development. The role of these pressure groups is to make sure local inhabitants have their say when social and environmental decisions are being taken. At the AFDB annual assembly, civil society was given a place at the head table. But what are these organizations doing alongside bankers and technical and financial partners? Organizations whose aims are not common knowledge and who represent diverse and varied groups of people. They had been invited by the African Development Bank to present their achievements and submit proposals with a new spin. NGO representative Luther Yamoego explains the role civil society intends to play. Partnerships entail a win-win dynamic. In this respect, we feel that the AFDB, with its potential as the leading investor in Africa, can be a vector arguing the case for civil society with government representatives. The bank can also establish mechanisms to boost civil society by opening doors to dialogue with various actors. In exchange, civil society can bring its experience as a mechanism bringing citizens' concerns to the forefront. Not so long ago, civil society was seen as a thorn in the side of the political establishment. Who can forget the footage of Alta globalization demonstrators besieging summits attended by heads of state, going head-to-head -head with officialdom and protesting against the power brokers. Now the picture is different, with the protesters, calling for a new take on development, invited to express their views. I think that civil society was long perceived by governments around the world, even in Europe, as a group of boat rockers. Now, on the contrary, the more civil societies brought on board upstream, the less problems there are when decisions are made. That is clear at international summits. Before, the NGOs were kept at arm's length. Now they are invited to take part. At the COP2, their inclusion made it easier to persuade governments to accept certain decisions. NGOs are increasingly involved in major debates on development. The young African activists were recently invited to take part in the European Development Days and the Business Climate Summit that preceded the COP21 in Paris. Friends of the Earth came to argue the case for the principle of fixed prices for carbon, with the idea of taxing environmentally harmful products that contribute to global warming. For Nicolas Ambert from NGO Green Cross, the climate is too important to be left in the hands of a few industrial groups. I think the issue we need to be addressing is that it is in everybody's interest to combat climate change. Where business and climate come together, we have major companies and middleweights. If we want to make sure the engagements of the COP21 are respected, we need to go find African SMEs, African startups and innovators. We need to make sure we are not putting all our eggs in one basket. We have to make sure there are actors across the continent.
The part to be played by civil society doesn't stop at questions concerning economic and social issues or sustainable development. It is also a key part of the political and democratic process. I believe that the more civil society is involved upstream, the more governments will have to watch what they do. I'm thinking specifically of the major projects that destroy the environment, projects we have seen a lot of in Africa in the past. We will not make the same mistakes again. Civil society is also very attentive to problems of corruption. Let's not forget the part civil society plays in the Maghreb, namely in Tunisia, where it was civil society that triggered the debate and later made sure the initial protests didn't get out of hand, ushering in democratic transition. Remember, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for that. The Africa 2016 meeting brought together 800 European and African businesses and staged a debate on civil society's contribution to development in Africa. Its role as a driving force for change is no longer disputed, from the Arab Spring to the popular uprising in Burkina Faso, as well as its contribution to the climate change debate. However, movements such as these would be even more effective if they were better structured and had the appropriate platforms. Failing that, civil society might rapidly lose its sting. Well, let's now meet this week's special guest. Professor Emmanuel Nandosi is a highly respected economist and a leading specialist on development issues. With numerous publications to his credit, he's also the Executive Secretary of the African Capacity Building Foundation. At the ACBF 25th anniversary this year, we spoke to Professor Nandosi about the distance covered so far and the road that remains to travel. Professor, Professor Emmanuel Nandosi, thank you for joining us on Initiative Africa. The ACBF, Africa Capacity Building Foundation, is 25 years old, 25 years of concrete action. What, for you, have been the landmarks over this past quarter century? Well, in the last 25 years, ACBF has built critical skills that will help African countries to design, implement, and monitor their development policies. In the last 25 years, ACBF has also been able to create and strengthen institutions that are critical for development. Whether they are parliaments, they are think tanks, they are policy units, and there are even you know, some educational institutions that are involved in capacity building. Also, ACBF has been able to empower women through spe special and specific programs that target women. And the foundation has also been able to promote regional integration in the continent, uh, especially through the support it gives to the African Regional Economic Communities, the RECS, and the African Union and its organs. But with all that has been done, has the situation in Africa actually improved? Is underdevelopment on the decline? Is poverty being eradicated? Bien sûr. Uh, Africa, Africa has improved uh, significantly uh, since 15 to 20 years. Uh, if you look back, let me begin by the time that African countries got their independence, which was uh, mostly in the 60s. You should ask yourself, for each African country, how many universities did you, do you ha did you have at that point? Many of them came out of independence without even a single university. So the building capacity at the tertiary level was non-existent. You'd have to go to Europe or to the United States or elsewhere to be educated. Uh, some countries I know had only one university. Others managed to have one or two. And uh, during, uh, between that period and now, many u countries have developed hundreds of universities within them. You take the case of Ethiopia, you can take the case of Nigeria, uh, you can see that they have lots and lots of universities everywhere. And this means that uh, you know, thousands and thousands of people have been educated, and I am one of them, uh, which would have been difficult if Africa was not making progress. Second thing is, if you look at the middle class, you would see that that has expanded significantly across the continent. And these are people who are now able to live the kind of lives 
that will permit them to improve their welfare, to be able to access uh, good education, good health care, um, educate their kids properly, and be able to live life that uh, one can you know, look at, at comparatively with life elsewhere. You can also see, also see that Africa has become a more peaceful continent uh, because there was a lot of uh, conflicts, especially in the 70s and the 80s. Major countries ranging from Ethiopia to Rwanda to um, DRC to um, the, almost uh, many of the West African countries and Central Africa, there were a lot of conflicts everywhere. But today, you can only count a few countries that are still facing significant conflict. Of course, Africa is facing the same kinds of uh, low intensity and you know, conflict or terrorism, which is a worldwide issue, by the way. But it is a far cry from what was there before. And then so from a political standpoint, the continent has made a lot of progress, and we should recognize that from more democratic uh, countries than, you know, uh, African countries used to have more dictators than democrat democratic countries. Today they have, the, the inverse is the case. You can hardly count the number of dictators you have, especially military dictators. Uh, from an economic standpoint, the continent has made tremendous impact, as I, as I indicated, in terms of uh, improving incomes. Of course, poverty remains still a problem, but uh, you have far more educated uh, Africans today than you had in the past. And from a social standpoint, uh, Africa actually leads the continent in, uh, or some African countries leads the, the world, not the continent, in represent, political representation in, in parliaments. Rwanda is an example, South Africa is also another example, and a few other countries that are in that domain. Uh, so I would say there are still a lot of, uh, Challenges, maternal, maternal health, uh, 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 maternal mortality health, you know, issues are still high. Poverty is still a problem. Climate change is devastating the continent as we see today. Uh, there are also other social issues, inequality, and so on and so forth. But overall, the, the gla glass is half full for me and not half empty. Mais professeur, le constat est que si on regarde. If I may, professor, if we look at the rankings for nations in terms of sustainable development. We are still in the same position among the underdeveloped nations. Redouble dans leur classe. Peut-être qu'il faut, comme le pense le professeur Malakoff. What if Professor Malakoff is right when he says we need our own reading of the situation? Malakoff maintains that the UN data does not take account of certain factors. Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? Well, I, I think uh, the, the point they are making is very important uh, because. Uh, let me take an example of the, uh, the, when they talk about economic growth, the GDP growth. Often we say the countries are growing uh, at uh, double digits, uh, but the reality is that this growth could be because they just came out of conflict and they were so low that any slight growth will have a significant impact from a percentage standpoint. Or that there has a massive increase in the prices of the primary commodities that they export and therefore uh, the growth rate might be deceptive when it comes to if you're measuring other things and you're only measuring the change of your GDP from one year to another. It doesn't measure who, you know, whether people's income has, has risen and uh, whether people are better off when it comes to having access to the basic uh, things of life or whether they feel more secure or have more opportunities. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know, we have to look at the reality of, uh, of countries before we can conclude uh, about certain things, uh, because uh, if you if you compare, uh, if you put into um, re reality the issues that are non-economic or that are, cannot be quantified, uh, that may also ha have impact on how people live and how they perceive themselves, then you realize that uh, we may not be measuring accurately uh, what may be considered to be people's happiness, or their state of mind, or how they live, or their welfare. Uh, but having said that, uh, we know when, if you have difficulty having electricity or if you don't have, um, you know, infrastructure that's well developed, uh, you don't have a transport system that's efficient that help people to move from one point to the other, if it, the cost of doing business is very high compared to what you can see elsewhere, which makes you uh, not competitive, uh, those are things that we cannot just simply uh, push aside and take for granted and they need to be addressed. Welcome back to Initiative Africa. 
Could the key to unlocking the doors to the world of work lie in technical and vocational training for young Africans? The Salam College, founded by an Ethiopian NGO, is in no doubt. For students who missed out on university studies, Salam offers top quality vocational training. This year, more than 200 graduates from the college found some work. Kumera Gumeshu and Francois Baudry report from Addis Abeba. According to World Bank estimates, there are more than 10 million jobs available for trained technicians in Africa. But there are no takers. For want of technical skills, many millions of young Africans are sitting on their hands. The African Union's Commission for Human Development agrees and intends to boost technical and vocational training. When you talk about youth unemployment here in Africa, we tend to think that means finding work as a civil servant or being someone's boss. That's why our policy for technical education and vocational training is insisting on a change of mindset. Young people must understand that when they choose a training course, they can also become an employer and create jobs. The young person will be able to pride himself on telling himself that he too will be an employer one day. It's important to bear that in mind. Education ministers gathered in Addis Ababa for the first meeting of the Committee for Technical and Professional Education overwhelmingly supported the African Union's position. To prove that actions speak louder than words, ten young Africans chosen from across the continent for their entrepreneurship presented their own projects during a full assembly, after which they were distinguished at an award ceremony. The awards are just the beginning. These awards are very important because it's a demonstration of the paradigm shift in provision of technical and vocational education and training in Africa. Because this is what is going to make the biggest difference in making the African youth bulge become an economic, demographic and social dividend. This is what will enable our young people to get the skills they need, not just to look for jobs, because many are jobless even as it is, but actually to become job creators. We met one of the award winners. The Salam College was founded in the suburbs of Addis Ababa. For the past 20 years, the school has been providing technical and professional training with a clear social mission. Most of the students find employment on graduating. Others are determined to set up their own businesses. I decided to take this professional training course because it interested me and because I want to show that women can work just as well as men in every kind of job. When I leave the school with my qualifications, I would like to set up in business repairing cars. I'm learning mechanical maintenance for heavy goods vehicles and earth moving machines. When I've graduated, I would like to work for a while in a company, but after that I want to set up my own garage, God willing. Established in 1989 by the Ethiopian NGO Village des Orphelins, the Salam College was initially intended to provide the village orphans with the technical and professional skills required to find work. The school was a resounding success and soon had to cater for demand from young people from across the region. A lot has changed at Salam in the past 20 years. When it was founded, the school had 19 students. Now, the 70-strong teaching staff at Salam provides free education for 430 students. From the beginning till now, the, there are a lot of progress in Salam. Previously, Salam had started the training with the simple welding technology, but now we have uh, 11 training streams engaged. That the trainings have an accreditation from the Ministry of Education from level one to level four. Thanks to partnerships with companies such as Volvo, the Salam College now has the resources it needs to go to the next level without losing its unique social dimension. Its most illustrious former students now teach at the school while others work in the Salam College workshop making parts for clients. Well, I was starting here to study uh, before three years ago by Metal Engineering Production Management and I'm level four students. And then, yeah, I just complete uh, the whole three years to study all the courses that I have to finish and to get a COC exam. That means the national assessment of the country. Uh, it's have uh, exams in each level. So I just done all the levels. 
And then, yeah, I just graduated from this Salam Technical and Vocational Center. And now I, I started working in this uh, CNC machine. Hundreds of young Ethiopians are in competition for a place at the school. True to their mission, the college directors are keen to make sure female candidates get their chance to work in technical trades. We are giving attention for the females because in Ethiopia, most of the time, females are staying, females are staying in, in, in home. But now, these days, we are trying to insist women to come to Infront and to have this technical knowledge. And we are working on that. Here in Addis Ababa, at the African Union meeting, the awards for the handful of pioneers may act as a catalyst for other professional and technical training initiatives. That, at least, is the declared intention of the AU Commission, convinced that skills kill youth unemployment. That's a good thought. It would be good to continue doing this kind of thing because the publicity is very good for raising the profile for TVET and also for young people to know that these opportunities exist. So if the resources are available, really such competitions will become a way of working. In Kenya, the DRC, Senegal and Botswana, success stories like the Salam College are increasingly common across Africa. They are often the result of young people's initiatives to find a way out of unemployment. They are the tiny acorns that grow into mighty oaks, mobilizing the continent's economic and political players. Let's now join David Tambiano for the second part of tonight's feature interview with Professor Nanduzi to discuss upcoming solutions to capacity building problems in Africa. At the ACBF's 25th anniversary, a highly placed World Bank representative stated the following. When a dam is built in Africa, it is done with foreign capital and Chinese workers with Africans stuck in menial jobs. Sad but true, no? What do you think about that? Is it a question of capability? Okay, I think the issue of um, proper utilization of existing capacity in Africa, well, and which is also linked to the issue of retention of capacity, is a major issue for the continent. Uh, what you have described in terms of uh, infrastructure that is in, uh, being built with foreign capital and uh, have foreign experts building it in the continent, it's not just simply an issue of capacity. Although capacity is very important there because there could be some specialized infrastructure where you don't have enough capacity in the country that you're dealing with it. But I would also quickly say that if we look at capacity from a continental perspective, chances are that you will find the kind of capacity you're, you're needing in a different country than the one that you are operating. And, that, and that's one issue that has to be looked at. Uh, and we're encouraging African countries to not just see the capacity um, shortages and, and gaps as just a country issue, but they should have a continental view of it. Because that will help uh, to have people who understand the continental context and uh, who are likely to be more sensitive to the local issues and help to build capacity locally. But it is a fundamental issue which uh, the late Prime Minister Meles used to talk about. You get what you negotiate. <clears throat> and countries, every country will try to promote it, its own interest. Uh, before China became uh, the economic power that it was, it insisted it relied a lot on capital from outside to build infrastructure and other things and to industrialize. But it insisted that that capital should come with the technology transfer so that it is not just the capital that is coming. Uh, we cannot say because we don't have the capacity to build an infrastructure, let's wait until we have the capacity. You can use capacity from outside. But you have to negotiate in such a way that in the process, your own internal capacity is also built. You can also work with ACBF to really target the areas where you have shortage of capacity uh, so we can develop some programs to assist in that regard. Professor, rather than organizing conferences, training courses and capacity building sessions, would it not be better to establish an African university capable of competing with Harvard and other international higher education institutions. Wouldn't this give Africa the critical mass it needs to support its own development? You know, the saying that uh, 
Rome was not built in a day. We can say that Harvard and Oxford were not built in a day. They were not always like this when they, were, when they started. As a matter of fact, Oxford was one of the worst universities <laughs> in when, it, when it started. So it, it didn't really begin as, as popular and as strong as it is today. So my, my thing is that the we African countries will need to pay attention to strengthening their existing universities. Uh, I, I think there has been a, an issue which is troubling, that the politicization of higher education has forced governments to think that the solution is to build as many universities as possible at the same time. I am not against building you know, many universities because where Africa started with you know, very few higher learning institutions and therefore needed to catch up. But this, the proper saying is room was not built in a day and universities are not like other kinds of institutions. Uh, they require a lot of things uh, that may not be easily available if you mass produce them. Therefore, the emphasis to me would have been how do you strengthen the, some of them so that they can have international standards and be respected and it can, they can really become universal, which is the real meaning of the word university. And therefore, they have a universal curriculum, they have a universal student body, they have a universal staff uh, people, and the res research can equal anyone, any research you can see in any place in the world. Uh, I think time has come for us to really look at this issue again and see how we can reinforce uh, the universities that are there and the vocational education institutions that are there rather than thinking that the solution is just every day creating ones that are not strong and that they are not even viable. How do you see the ACBF 10 years from now, 25 years from now? The future of ACBF is very bright. I'm very, very excited about the future. The reason is because it is clear to everybody now that capacity is the missing link you know, for Africa's development. If you don't build capacity, you will not be able to implement all these very nice strategies and all these agendas that we have. And so that understanding is becoming more and more widespread. Therefore, it means that we at, at ACBF have demonstrated that we are very relevant to the continent. We will accompany the, the continent in diagnosing the problem. We will accompany the continent in um, de de devising the strategy to deal with the, these challenges. And we will accompany the, con the continent in implementing the strategies and we will, even more importantly, monitor and evaluate these processes and make sure that the, re the results that we expect are obtained. And so NCBF is, has now created a new five-year plan, uh, our strategy for 2017-2021, and uh, which is really responding in a very direct way uh, to the capacity challenges of the continent. And we have also devised some um, uh, modalities for implementing them that will assure our own uh, sustainability. Uh, but we know that there's a lot of support out there which we have to mobilize to be able to fund the foundation so that it can achieve its objectives and it can fulfill its, its vision of an Africa capable of achieving its own development. Professor. Finally, Professor, two major challenges lie ahead for Africa namely the digital economy and the green economy. Is the ACBF well placed to accompany the continent as it faces these challenges? Yes, one of the modalities of our intervention in, in the next five years is what we call uh, capacity innovation. And specifically, we are going to be paying attention, one, in innovative ways of building capacity, but also capacity in innovative areas. In other words, uh, green economy or knowledge economy or all, ki all the other you know, innovations that are out there, which is the future, ACBF is going to put some priority in developing the capacity for Africa to move in that direction. So this is our view on that. Merci, Professor Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's all from Initiative Africa today. You can catch the show again on our website at www.initiative-africa.com. Don't forget, next week, same time, same place for Business Africa, your rendezvous for the continent's economic news. Have a great week. Goodbye.